In, in John's gospel, light and darkness are major themes. And John had set that up in something we hadn't read. The first 18 verses of the gospel of John are called the prologue. And there, among other things, John tells us that Jesus is the light. He's, uh, the light gives life to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Now, from this point forward, I mean, from af after the prologue going forward, there, there's almost always more going on than meets the eye. There's the stuff that you read, and then there's the stuff behind it that is often, more often than not, connected in some way to the prologue. So, for example, last week, Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night. Now, he may very well have come at night, but John wants us to see more than that. John wants us to see Nicodemus in the dark coming to the light. Right? He wants us to get that. And here is the Samaritan woman, and it's broad daylight. The sun is high up in the sky. Light is everywhere. But something dark is going on in her heart. And we, will, and we see that as the story continues. And in this gospel, light does three things. It reveals, and then there's a response of some kind, and then there's a result. And uh, to illustrate this, I'm going to use the, the colic for purity. Light reveals, Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. There's a response. We ask, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit. And then there's the result, which is worship that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. So that's an example of how light works in, in the gospel. And something along these lines exactly is happening in the story of the Samaritan woman. And the first thing to say about how it reveals is the light in this particular case, even more so than with Nicodemus, the Nicodemus story is kind of left open-ended. We're not quite sure where he is with Jesus and what he thinks about Jesus. We do get an idea much, much later uh, in the gospel that Jesus, uh, Jesus has touched him in some way, but we don't know that yet. And here in, in this, though, Jesus himself is being revealed to this woman, and she's seeing him, uh, and her belief sort of progressively gets, gets stronger as, as the story goes on. And of course, she also is revealed. The Samaritan woman comes at noon, and th the question immediately hanging is why? Why would a Samaritan woman be coming to the well in the middle of the day unless she deliberately didn't want anyone else to be around? And that being the case, what's going on with her. And then, of course, to say nothing of the fact that Jesus has been there waiting, uh, probably for her, and, and that here he is alone, and in, I cannot overstate what a big deal it is for a Jewish male to be alone with a woman anywhere, let alone speak to her. And on top of that, she's a Samaritan. And the Jews, as, as you know, Jews and Samaritans did not get along at all. So Jesus speaks to her, give me a drink. And she, of course, is astonished at the question. And then Jesus tells her, if you knew who it was who was asking you for a drink, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is asking you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would, be, he would have given you living water. And she's thinking plumbing. That somehow Jesus is talking about getting the water from the well to the town. So that would be really cool. <laughs> She's like, I'd like to see that. I, 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 that would save me a lot of trouble. And to give her some credit, the, the phrase living water meant water that's moving. So 
the pool of Siloam, for example, was living water because it was fed from an underground spring and it was always being refreshed. A, a river or stream was living water. So we can cut her some slack if she misunderstands Jesus, but she still doesn't get it even when Jesus gets cryptic in his answer. Yeah, well, all the stuff about eternal life and all that, this water's going to well up in someone, and she's still kind of not getting it. You must be talking about plumbing. But then she asks, are you, are you greater than our father Jacob who got this, you know, he, brought, he made this well, he got this well, he and his, his kids and his donkeys and all those people that used to drink here. Are you greater than he is? And then he says, get your husband. I don't have a husband. She's revealed. The light is beginning to reveal Jesus. She sees something in him. She's not quite sure what it is, but all she can muster at this point is, are you greater than our father Jacob? How is she going to respond? to all of this. Her response is both beautiful and comical. And I've already alluded to the beautiful part. She tells the truth. I, I have no husband. Now, those of you who can remember being teenagers, and those of you who are teenagers, have you ever been in a situation where you were caught and then you were asked if you did what you were caught doing. And there's this moment when you can either tell the truth or lie. And more often than not, what do kids do? They lie. Oh no, it wasn't me. And we all know that, yeah, you're doggone well, it was you. I had that kind of moment. I had several of those kind of moments, actually. But the one that really sticks out in my mind was when I worked for Friendly Ice Cream. And I, I was among the people who were closing the store one particular night, and so, one of the older folks, who was obviously 18 or older, brought beer. Need I say anything else? The next morning, as it turns out, that most of the people who were working there that night were also working uh, midday, and the manager was there. And the manager's calling people into the office one by one and they're not coming back and then he calls me he calls me into his office I walk into the office he shuts the door he sits down he looks at me and he says Ben did you participate in the party last night and I can still feel that heat of flush rising up from my chest and this this instantaneous argument that went on for only a second. Do I lie? Do I tell the truth? Should I? What do I do? And then I said, yes, sir. And he said, you still have a job. Now go back to work. He didn't need to say anything else. I learned my lesson. And I, I've always wondered if something like that is happening with this woman. Go get your husband. Oh, okay. <laughs> And then she not come back, right? But no, she says, no, uh, I don't have a husband. And he says, well, that's right, because you've had five husbands, and the guy you're shacked up with now is not your husband. This you've said truthfully. Of course, she didn't say any of that. All she said was, I don't have a husband. He filled in the rest. But somehow she hangs in there with him. And then here comes the comical part. First comes a rise in her belief in who she sees. Who, who is Jesus to her? It starts with, are you greater than our father Jacob? And now it's, sir, I see that you're a prophet. And then she changes the subject. And what better subject to, talk, to pick than religion? Our ancestors worship on this mountain, but you say the place to worship is in Jerusalem. It's comical and beautiful at the same time. 
and she's doing what we all do, but she, hang, she hung in there. And what's the result? Well, the result is if it's not worship directly, it's certainly about worship. The hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And it's at that point that she says something about the Messiah. She doesn't say that he's the Messiah. It's almost as if she wants to ask the question, but it's just too terrifying and wonderful to even hope for that he could be the Messiah. And so she just says, well, I, I know that Messiah is coming, but that's enough. I'm he. Now, the whole thing about spirit and truth, what Jesus is saying to her is that worship isn't about a place, it's about a person. It doesn't matter whether you're on this mountain or in Jerusalem, it's who are you worshiping? And see, it's, that's what leads to the statement about the Messiah and Jesus saying, yes, I am he. In other words, I'm the one you'll be worshiping. Now, this is as far as she can go in the story of John because John, Jesus hasn't died and risen yet. So to say or even hope that he's the Messiah is a big deal. John doesn't say she worshipped. She, she becomes an evangelist, really. And she goes back to town. And by the way, if you notice that there's this interlude in John that sort of breaks up the story. Uh, I had a professor in seminary say, speculate that someone was carrying the manuscripts of John and tripped and fell and the papers went everywhere and they got them all back in the wrong order. Because here's this story about I've got bread, to, you know, I've got food to eat from that you don't know about and all that stuff that has nothing to do with the story. Anyway, that's, a, that's parenthetical. Jesus has, has said to her, I am the Messiah. She hasn't worshipped him per se, but now she goes and tells everyone that will listen who she has encountered. And many believed in Jesus because of her testimony and many more believed after encountering Jesus themselves. But isn't that a sign of worship anyway? I mean, the last prayer in our service says as much. Send us out to do the work you've given us to do. The light has revealed Jesus to her and the light has revealed her. She responded by hanging in there. And the longer she hung in there, the deeper her faith in him or her belief in him became. Are you greater than our father Jacob? Oh, I see you're a prophet. Well, I know the Messiah is coming. I am he. As we'll see as the story goes on, not everyone responds this way to Jesus. And ultimately, the negative responses lead to his crucifixion. Lent, in large part, I think, is an exercise in being revealed. The, the Ash Wednesday litany, if you can think back to then, the Ash Wednesday litany of prayer is exhaustive and exhausting. To, to read through, it just like covers every single base and every single year I hear myself in it, I see myself in it. The light is shining in the dark corners of your lives. How are you going to respond? And your response pretty much determines the result. Let us pray. Jesus, we all have our own wells that we only visit when no one else is around. Come and meet us at our wells. Shine your light into our hearts. Reveal what needs to be confessed, to be healed, to be forgiven. Open our eyes to look at the light of the world and see Jesus for who he is 
the Messiah, the King and Savior of the world, and then worship Him in spirit and truth. Amen.